uh, YouTube. So. Okay. Over. We still there? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, good. Because the uh, lot of the thing just defaulted to a different screen on the phone, so. Uh, All right. I think the main meeting has begun. Okay. Or if if we're live, I'll begin the intro. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the May 2021 uh, meeting of the Chicago TI User Group. Uh, it's been quite a uh, quite a year for us, and um, we have uh, made some. Uh, progress getting towards uh, an actual live meeting, but in the meantime, here we are on Zoom. Uh, we have a very good meeting, a uh, uh, number of demonstrations lined up for you today. So um, perhaps what we'll do is uh, I have a couple of small announcements. Uh, the, um, the fair is still a little bit up in the air in that um, we haven't received permission yet from the library, which is our venue, uh, to hold the event on the day that we have requested. So what we'll do is we will uh, let everyone know as soon as we know, and uh, we're making preparations in the meantime uh, for a successful event, and we hope that these preparations will come to fruition. At any rate, uh, without further ado, let me introduce the people who are here today. Um, um, Jim Bezirk is uh, our uh, technical director, uh, John Shanfield uh, is putting this uh, show on uh, YouTube for us. Uh, I believe Tom Clayton is also uh, here with us today, hopefully. And um, Vic Sturp, of course, our president, is ready and willing to do a number of very interesting demos today. I'm Hal Shanfield, uh, the uh, fair chairman. And uh, so without further ado, Vic, over to you. Okay, thank you, Hal. The uh, past month has been real busy for me on getting various programs from different vendors. Uh, one of the uh, premier ones was one from uh, Keith Bergman called his uh, Dice Pack programs. And uh, these are this is a collection of three different programs. And his production was limited to, I believe, uh, 300 discs. And it comes in a nice uh, cardboard backed wrapper. And he has an instruction manual that actually tells you how to load the games, how to play the games, and stuff like that. I have to change the uh, compact flash card in my Nano PEB. So I'll be doing that for a moment here. You're going to lose the TI signal. Or not. So I took the one compact flash card out and I'm putting in the one that I've loaded the programs for uh, today. Uh, there's some minor problems I'm having is uh, I don't have a TIPI yet. There we go, we're back. So I'll reset the uh, final GROM, the red button. Select number two for the final ground. Uh, space bar down to the next menu screen. And uh, E for uh, RXB 2015. Let's see if we can get this one to load here. Orphan Tech. Welcome to Dice Pack One. Uh, copyright 2021 Keith Bergman. Uh, the three games are Dice Crash, Six It, and Dice Rack. So we're going to try to play uh, game number two, Six It. So he has the instructions. 
A game of six it consists of six rounds of six dice rolls each. Players roll ten dice at a time. And uh, any sixes are set aside. So here I'll press uh, number two for instructions. Uh, players may also choose to select any two dice that add up to six and set those aside as well. The computer automatically sets aside anything that displays a six. And when you pick any two dice, uh, those will also have a red underline under them showing that they have been set aside. Uh, the player scores the face value of all selected dice. Any unselected dice at the end of six rolls will be deducted from that score. Okay. Your six rolls, let me tell your score. You get the face value of all sixes and, and select the dice. Unselected dice are deducted. Okay, select all 10 early points early and get six bonus points plus six per unused roll. So if you finish up at like six rolls, you know, then uh, you get bonus points, or even at nine rolls, you get bonus points. A uh, high score after six or six rounds wins. May the six be with you. That's the space bar. Okay, we're going to play the game. Player one is a human. Player two is a computer named Laredo. Huh. Sets up the play screen. Okay. Vic, it's my roll one. Press the space bar. Okay. So at the bottom of the screen, you see we don't have any uh, sixes have come up. But there are some combinations here that total up to six. So two and uh, no, not two. Yeah, two and six. Total up to six and uh, three and eight total up to six and also one and nine total up to six. Okay, at X, uh, I can press X to exit. That's the end of my roll. Oh, it's my turn until I've used all my rolls up. And then it's the uh, opponent's turn. So it's my turn again. It does not alternate between two players. Okay, so I can select like four and five, and that's it. Okay, what do we have? We got uh, no, nothing there. Four and one, no, nothing there. Two and five, no, nothing there. Five and five, no, nothing there. It's toes up. Round one, I only made 14 points. So the computer rolls, rolls again. Oh, see, man, got two sixes there. Computer sort of beat me on that one. So roll one. I got a, oh, I can do a four and a five. And uh, a six and a seven. And a nine and a zero. I think that's about that. So the only problem with doing a match is you don't get the total high points. You know, you, you go out earlier. I got a one and a two. Got to wait and see if I get a six for the eight. No. Oh, 
Well, I doubled my score from the previous round. Now it's the computer's turn. Laredo, does anybody remember Laredo? Uh, the reference to that name. Uh, yeah, I know it's a town in uh, Texas, but I believe uh, Laredo was the name of the artist that did the funny cartoons in uh, 99 or Home Computer Magazine. That was his pen name. Okay, so one roll space. Oh, I lucked out. Okay, so I'm not going to do any combos this time around. I like that he's got two different keys. Uh, X to exit and uh, space to roll after you've exited. Because a lot of times you sort of sit there and you keep it in the same key real fast all the time. Ah, I got another six there. And you go, oops, I didn't mean to uh, just blast right through that. Okay. That was roll number six, <coughs> which I think is my last roll. Unfortunately, I can't really uh, make anything out of what they've given me here because you can only add two dice, not three. So that was better than trying to match stuff or add up any two adjacent dice. Although I think the computer will always... Uh, add up stuff when it has the chance to do so. Ah, computer beat me anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I think you get the idea of how to play the game here. Uh, it's fun. We're going to... Uh, going to break the program, run it again. Uh, I think Keith, uh, on his notes on the uh, Facebook page he belongs to, uh, he had said that he uh, I think he said he's been working on this for like five years. Uh, let's look at number three, license credits. Uh, conceived in 2013, finished in 2019, version one. Uh, distribution to any physical form by anybody with the author is expressly forbidden. Uh, thanks to Facebook and Atari H99ers. Uh, press any key. Uh, in the book that he has on the inside front cover, he has his Welcome to Dice Pack 1, and uh, yeah, uh, these games are free to distribute online. I believe he means in a digital format. Sales of new copies in physical form on the floppy by anyone but the author is expressly forbidden. So in other words, don't make copies and put them on eBay is what I'm saying here. Acknowledgements. Many thanks to my procrastination partner, Matt Barnes, and to the members of the Atari Age TI forums, especially Waleed Maluli, for archiving my games and so many others at 3WTIGameshelf.net. Artwork by uh, Mark uh, Bookwalter. So... Uh, I think I'm going to be in the market for a, a TIPI because of uh, the rigmarole I have to go through to actually uh, do these games and such. As uh, you might have seen, is I use for these meetings a uh, nano PEB on the side of the computer that uses 
these compact flash cards. And uh, to put it on the Nano PEB from a floppy disk, like this one, I have to put it into my P box and copy it onto an electronic uh, floppy emulator that uses an SD card in a particular format. And then uh, once it's on that card, I can put it on a PC and copy that particular, I think it's called HF feed uh, format uh, file and uh, convert it with the pro conversion program that came with the floppy uh, emulator to a .dsk format, a V1999 format, disk format, uh, which I can then use TIDIR uh, which is the only program that can write to a uh, SD card uh, in a way that the floppy emulator, uh, that the uh, uh, CF7 slash nano PEB device can read it. Uh, so it's a bit of a rigmarole for me to go through here. So I must have touched something because this floppy disk worked flawlessly in my P box, but for some reason, due to the conversion pro. pro processes and such. If I press 1 for dice crash, which I really enjoyed, uh, it loads, but then when it tries to run, uh, the program crashes. This is not a fault of anything that Keith has done. I must have, like I said, I've made a mistake or I corrupted something during the conversion processes. Because uh, what I had happen here is it loads and it tries to run. And the load program loads just fine. Oh, now it makes a liar out of me. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, this is Dice Crash. Dice Crash is sort of unique. Because uh, dice are crashing to the ground. Arrange them as they fall for maximum points. Uh, if you take too long to place them, a blank will fall. And the score is tallied when the play field is full. And watch for power-ups. Some will help you, some don't. A brief description here is you have five columns to work with. And you have to, the dice fall one at a time, and you determine which column they fall in. What you're attempting to do is make uh, pretty much what you'll feel would be poker hands of one pair, three of a kind, uh, uh, four of a kind, uh, two pair, uh, straight or royal flush, stuff like that. Uh, you know, two, three, four, five, six, uh, things like that. Um, however, you're only dropping one die at a time, so it really uh, takes a lot of strategy to try to figure out what you're trying to do at what appropriate level. Uh, this uh, takes somebody with a much sharper mind than I have to play this. So your left and right arrow keys uh, move uh, the dice, the die, and the enter will drop it. Uh, if you don't press enter, uh, you take too long, it'll turn to a blank die, and you won't get any score for it. Or press 3 at the main menu to adjust the game controls. So here's your scoring, as you can see on the screen. On the upper right, three of a kind, where you got three twos, and then two that don't match, or 20 points. A two pair shows two fours and two uh, ones uh, is 40 points. A straight, a one, two, three, four, five is 60 points. Or, you know, or, you know, two, three, four, five, six would be the same. A full house, uh, three of a kind and a pair, four of a kind, uh, 50 times the die value, and five of a kind, which you don't get in poker without getting shot, uh, is 100 times the die value. Press any key. So here's the power-ups, and this can make it really uh, interesting here, where you have to memorize all this, and then when you see it at the top of the screen, you got to decide, uh, gee, do I want this or not? Uh, so uh, power up uh, the diamond, clears the row, and earns its points. Okay. Uh, your fourth programs, pre programmers will like this next one. Change all the dice in the column to dice at the top. 
uh, score multiplier, clear a column and earn all its points, scrambles top dice horizontal row, jackpot roll for bonus, blanks top five dice, blows up three columns, no points. Yes, I suppose uh, that'd be worthwhile. But this is like a combination of Tetris, but you're scoring with poker hands. Good luck. Uh, now let's try playing it. I took too long to drop that one. Okay, my arrow keys don't seem to be moving this. So I'll see what uh, what key this is. You know, I might have just had a bad connection on my Nano PB in the side of the speed synthesizer when I tried running this earlier today. Since this is running correctly. Try option number three, adjust the controls. Uh, left is the left arrow key. Right is the right arrow key. And drop is enter. Okay, let's see how it works now. Okay, now it works correctly. And I took too long to drop that one. So I gotta figure out what I'm trying to do here. So here I got one pair. And on the second row, I'll have a pair. Second row, I'll have three of a kind. Ah, no score for that one. Ah, took too long. It's trying to get... Uh, Trying to get another pair on that row. There. I got two pair on row number one. Ah. Got three of a kind on row number two. And three of a kind on row number three. Might as well fill that row up. Oh, now I got a one. Could have had four of a kind. Took too long. So yeah, this could be a little confusing where they drop vertically, but you're scored on a horizontal. Ah, darn. Okay, I totaled up my score, but not really much I can do with that. Yeah, it uh, scrolls 
off of one side of the screen and onto the other. pair, at least three of a kind, one pair, at least one, ah, four of a kind, two pair, Okay, let's see what the score is on that, how that totals it up, tallies it up. Uh, these are all an extended basic. Okay, so it's figured out my whole score there. I scored 290 on that game. All right. So that's the uh, actually the first game on the uh, list was uh, Dice Crash. We already played six at press any key. And uh, we're going to quit the game. Oh. Yeah, so on uh, the Facebook pages that uh, Keith was on announcing this game, uh, he had said he had worked on this for a long time. Let's try Dice Rack. This will be uh, a typical TI meeting program because I haven't played this one before. And this is the problem I was having before where uh, something would crash. And like I said, I think this is an artifact with my Nano PEB. Uh, or converting it from one format to another. It's no fault through Keith's. These programs all ran fine on the disk. So uh, a lot of fun. You might find this on uh, Waleed uh, Maluli's uh, TI Game Shelf uh, internet page and uh, be able to download it if you have the, uh, if you have the ability to do that. Okay. Actually, okay, what we're going to do here is we're going to swap the floppy disk uh, the disks in the virtual disk drive. So I'll tell it to take out the disk that's in uh, drive number one. And uh, on my notes here, uh, 702, and put uh, volume number 702 in drive number one. Uh, if anybody has any questions on this, uh, you know, comment uh, on the chat or anything like that and let us know. Okay. Select our XP. And okay, there's no automatic load program. So we'll load the directory program from our XP. Disk number one. And it's Battlestar. And uh Oh, there's the uh, Battlestar is the program file, and TI99IUCNFO uh, is the DV80 or text file. Uh, so what we'll do here is uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to load a program off of disk number three, 
disk drive three called boot. Load that and uh, do a directory uh, for disk one. Tag down, press V for view, and then enter. And Italian, okay. Uh, I can't read Italian, so I'm at a disadvantage, but they have it in English here. This file has been downloaded from website of the TI-99 Italiana User Club, uh, 3w.ti99iuc.it. You can download other stuff for the TI-99-4A in the databases section of the website. Okay. So go back to our uh, menu program here. Do a directory. Okay, we're going to run Battlestar. Now this uh, program was written from, let me get my notes here. Here's a uh, copy of the page of the uh, Italian user group uh, Facebook page. Gee, I can't quite seem to get a good focus on this. Oh. And the game started without uh, me touching anything. The object of the game is you have a battle star in the middle of the screen and fighters show up at the four points of the compass and they will launch missiles at you. So by pressing the appropriate arrow key, uh, you will fire a ray gun at the missile and destroy it. And if once you destroy it, you can fire another ray gun again and actually take out that fighter aircraft. But another one pretty quickly shows up to take its place. Uh, so your four keys are E for one vertical of you, X for one to the bottom of you, S for the left and D for the right. Uh, rather than me moving my fingers around, I always find I use this kind of format. Uh, this hand does left and right, and this one does up and down. So we'll press Y and say yes. It starts out slow. See that one's fired a missile. Now the north and south ones, you gotta watch out because they're a lot closer to you. You might want to zap those. Oh. <laughs> That's how the game always ends. Uh, I don't uh, know if uh, you get a bonus round if you reach a real high score. Or if uh, that's all you can do is just try to play against yourself and reach a high score. It uh, says here, uh, the battle starship remains fixed in the center of the screen. Uh, at some point in the game, the aliens will become so fast, so it will be difficult to operate the directional keys at the required speed. The end of the battle star will be inevitable. There is, however, an automatic speed control in the program. By reaching the maximum speed level and managing to maintain it, the resistance of your fingers will at that point be the only limiting factor. Uh, the game is very short and simple, requires, 30, uh, requires only 3K of memory and extended basic. For each uh, missile intercepted and destroyed, the score will increase by 20 points. For each alien ship eliminated, uh, 50 points. So that's a nice, fun little game. Going on here, again, from the Italian user group.
That's catalog that's on drive two. Okay, that's our meetings program. So we'll remove this disk. Let me check my notes. Uh, we want uh, volume 705. Select the drive number one. Okay, apparently there's nothing there. I mean, there's not a load program there. Okay, and there's the, uh, this is called Scopa, and it's a uh, 80 sector uh, internal variable 254 extended basic program. And there's another uh, TI uh, info there, which probably credits the Italian user group again. So I'll select this. Now, what's interesting about this game is this again was from a, uh, a magazine called uh, Micro and Personal Computer Magazine is where this uh, program listing was in. Uh, number uh, four, Numbers 43 and 44, published in 1984. Uh, the Italian user group has this link right here that if you click on it, will take you right to that page and you can open up that magazine and see uh, what it is. Uh, unfortunately, this is all in Italian. And uh, what's encouraging is they say how faithful this is to the original game of Brome, uh, the very famous Italian card game complete with all the rules and with a deck almost identical to the real one has been translated into extended basic language on the TI. Scopa, which takes up 24K of memory, stands out from other versions for its excellent graphics, simplicity of play, and similarity to real games. All the rules of the original game apply and are respected. At the beginning, the computer asks you how many points you want to finish the game and if you prefer to play with the cards face up or face down. Uh, this only applies to the cards of the computer, as your cards are always visible. So this first question the computer is asking me is how many points do I want uh, to win? Uh, I don't know. I guess I'll say 10 points and press the Enter key. Okay, and then the second question is, uh, do you want to play with them? Uh, uh, do you cut uh, corporate? Uh, C or no, do you want to play with the cards visible or not? I'm assuming that's what that top line says. Hey, if anybody from the Italian user group is watching, uh, please message us and tell us how to play this game and what the rules are. So by going with the written instructions on the Italian user group website, uh, which says what it's going to ask you, I imagine the only two keys that are valid are S and N for C and no. Uh, so you want them face up or face down. I just don't know if this, these words are saying, do you want them face up or face down? I'll press S. Okay, one card for each side is drawn by lot. Who will get the highest card will be the cart cartel to the first hand. In subsequent hands, the rolls will be alternated. Okay, so we've got uh, a two, a seven, seven, okay. So I am most ignorant of what these symbols mean 
and how you score on it. But the uh, written uh, texture on the uh, uh, internet page says, the computer cards are play displayed in the upper left of the game screen. The player's cards in the lower right. Play, please. And those played during the game in the center. Uh, so this is asking me, uh, do I want by, hmm, I don't know what that means. The TI will also correct any errors to allow us to try again, but only up to a certain point, because if we insist on making mistakes, it will interpret it as an attempt to want to cheat and will abandon the game. Also, for those who have the speech synthesizer, this will be used during matches, obviously with English spoken. Now, there's three versions of this you can download from the Italian user group. Uh, this one with speech in the 32K, uh, one that's a light version. It just runs in XB, doesn't need 32K. And uh, another one with no speech. So it, it doesn't talk if uh, you don't want it to. In general, the game proves to be quite fast in making decisions on the right move to make when there are a few cards left to play. But in some cases, for example, with more cards on the table, the way can get really drastic, especially if the speech synthesizer is not connected. The game will slow down exasperatingly due to the instructions sent to a non-existent peripheral. Uh, to overcome this problem, you'll find a version without speech. So yeah, uh, don't load the speech version if you don't have a speech synthesizer plugged in. Uh, for the rest, playing Broomstick with the TI proved to be fun anyway. The artificial intelligence developed by the author is really well built. For further information on the game, I refer you to the magazine that published it in 1984, Micro and Personal Computer. Okay. And on the back here shows yet another uh, picture uh, from the uh, Italian Music Group uh, uh, website. Uh, here's the three versions. Uh, you can right click on them and tell them where to download. If you want the extended basic version uh, that needs 32K, the extended basic version and doesn't need it, uh, that doesn't have speech or the, uh, or the light version. So altogether, uh, this looks like a fun game. I can only guess uh, what this means uh, per combio, per scatola. I'll just press one. Okay. Okay, Wait, so uh, if you do download this, uh, you're going to have to uh, get out your uh, English uh, Italian translator and uh, translate uh, the instructions or look up the instructions to, I think it's called Broom or Broomstick and see how it's played. I just downloaded these the other night, so I haven't had the chance to do that. You might be wondering, like, come on, Vic, you know, what have you been doing? Well, <laughs> trying to get a lot of stuff set up here. All right, we're going to go back to our notes. Oh, yeah. Reset the final round. Uh, there's a third game I discovered. And I stashed it here on the SD card under uh, new files and then uh, under H here for new games. And uh, yeah, there's Battlestar, which was available as either a disk version or a binary file.
So as you may have noticed, this binary file, that's a cartridge file, uh, plays a lot faster than the extended basic uh, disk file. Uh, it might be it's so fast there it's not fun. But uh, if you like real fast arcade games, then that's the one for you. Also, you see how that file shows up as option number two on the uh, first selection. Hmm. So I'll reset the final ground once again, get our final ground menu, and uh, go to RxB, uh, period, D for directory. Hmm. Well, let's see if this runs an extended basic. Oh, I guess not. Okay. Some people had uh, talked about this program uh, several months ago, uh, Super Space Acer. Try it again. It's always fun to try to figure out what it runs in. Okay. And I managed to fool around so much, I hung up the computer here. It's going to have to reload Extended Basic. Do a directory for drive one. And this ought to be it. So let's see if I can. Ah, there we go. Super Space Acer. Uh, this is not the program running. This is actually a TI artist picture uh, that it loads in. Is a uh, is the opening screen title graphic. So, to Super Space Acer by Mike Ward, copyright 1992 by Julius Software. Press fire to begin. So I'll start by pressing the alpha lock up. I got joystick number one. Press the fire button. how those games always end for me. Uh, I'm having about a half a second delay on my video screen, so it's very difficult to try to play video games. But let's give it another uh, let's give it another try here.
Okay, so I learned I can't shoot the uh, the uh, missiles or the bombs that are sent my way, those little green dots, uh, but I can shoot the uh, ships that fire them. So super space ace here. Okay. Uh, we'll remove that disc. And insert another. All right, this is from a collection from Craig Miller uh, called Miller's Graphics, and it's uh, several uh, several programs here uh, that uh, this is almost like a companion to Miller's book, The Smart Programming Guide for Sprites. Uh, he comes up with some mathematical formula to compress uh, multiple lines at extended basic into one line. Uh, so as far as looking at your joystick to see if you uh, want a motion, uh, to uh, starting a sprite in auto motion, uh, to check uh, two sprites from coincidence, um, he has a mind like a uh, like a trap, where he was able to figure out all sorts of stuff to make uh, an extended basic programs that are actually pretty responsive. My favorite one here is number four, Blackbeard's Treasure. It comes up with a very simple uh, graphic of the sharks. Uh, okay, yeah, let's uh, look for instructions. 15 men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. Your five-man diving team has found the lost treasure of Blackbeard the Bright Pirate. Unfortunately, it's at the bottom of a shark-infested sea, and it is protected by two giant octopuses. Warning. The sharks haven't been fed in some, since the last time someone played this game, and they love to eat divers. The number one joystick or the arrow keys, E, S, D, and X, will move your diver off the boat and about the water. If your diver is moving down and you press the left or right arrow key, he will decrease his down motion and increase his sideways motion. Try it. Okay, so here we'll go down. Now here we'll go sideways. And of course, he comes off the top of the screen. Alpha lock up. So you have pretty good control of uh, your diver. Press let, hold down the C key to continue. Your diver will move slower on the sandy bottom than he does while swimming in the waters. If you place the diver's down hand on the treasure, he will pick it up. He can hold up to three treasures at a time, but each one will decrease his maximum ascent speed. So it simulates uh, having natural mass added to your body. To add treasures, your diver must be holding... Uh, to add treasures to your score, your diver must be holding a treasure and bring him up to the middle of the boat, and he'll automatically climb aboard. For every 10 treasures you bring up, the difficulty will increase by 
one, increasing the number of sharks, and two, increasing the speed of the sharks and the octopi. For every 20 treasures you bring up, you'll receive an extra diver. Good luck. P.S. Playing with the octopi or petting the sharks could be hazardous to your health. Uh, one, to use the number one joystick. Initializing, please wait. Okay, so there's your diver at the top in the boat. And there's the sharks cruising back and forth, the ocean. And there's the octopi at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, everything that scrolls off on one side of the screen. See, I went down real fast. So I hit the... Uh, So you see at the top right of the screen, it's increased to treasures or number th uh, three now. So for this guy, he must be a hard hat diver. Uh, you really got a lot of inertia in this game. Uh, you descend too fast. I better go up to miss these uh, pesky octopi. Okay, I could finish off this screen. Uh, when you collect all the treasures, uh, you get another screen where the treasures are a different color. And yes, the sharks and the octopi move faster. Here, I'll just jump off and show you what happens when uh, you try to pet a shark. <coughs> yes, it plays ominous music. And you lose a diver. <coughs> and if you just linger on the bottom and an octopus gets you, <coughs> it plays ominous music and the octopus scuttles away. All in all, this is a fun game. Uh, it uh, moves uh, slow enough. You can control your guy. And it does show pretty much inertia on once you could go in in one direction uh you keep moving in that direction uh quite a bit quite fast so uh we'll try like uh option number one here the battle over titan Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's go for instructions here. The year is 2033. It's not that far away anymore. This was written in what, 1990, earlier than that? Uh, your short-range scanner is located toward craft. 
that are out to destroy your outpost on Titan. You have five fighter drones that are in working order. The rest are in for repair. The Torgs don't realize it, but because of the number of their ships, their laser scanners are interfering with one another, which is creating weak areas in their scanning and laser weapon aiming systems. Press C to continue. These weak areas will show up on your scanner monitor as blue areas. If you keep your drone moving in these blue areas, they can uh, the torque will only fire randomly. They might hit you with a lucky shot, but they it can't really aim at you. But if you stay in one place too long, they will be able to find you. Your, if your drone drifts out of the safe zones, they will be able to lock on target and destroy it. Their laser weapons are energy seeking, so for safety, your drone will shut down all power when they fire. Be careful you don't drift into an unprotected area. Any key or the fire button will launch your drone. If you're in range, your phasers are very accurate. And any key on the right hand side of the keyboard or the fire button will engage your self aiming phasers. If you're in range, your phasers will fire. If you're not, a flashing red dot will indicate their position. For every Torg ship you destroy, you get 500 points. For every 20,000 points, allows you to bring another drone out of the repair shop. Time is crucial. Each second after you launch costs you two points. The arrow keys, ESDX, or the number one joystick will move your ship. The longer you hold down a key, the faster you'll go. It takes as long to slow down as it does to speed up, but you can turn on a dime. Hi, right, okay. Uh, we'll go for the number one joystick. Choose the level of play. The higher the level, the shorter the range of your phasers, and the more often the Torgs will return fire. So zero, level zero is a good place to start. One, easy but less range. Two, some skill needed. Three, starting to get tricky. Four, a bit of a challenge. Five, hard to get to 40,000 points. Six, repaired drones are rare. Seven, it's just a game. Eight, goodbye outpost, and nine, impossible. Keep your ship moving or they will destroy it. It's nice to see a programmer with a sense of humor. Choose a level of play. Uh, I'll uncharacteristically go for the easy level. So your scanner is looking for weak areas. No, I'm happy with that. Uh, like most uh, maze-making games, uh, this one can actually create impossible air areas that you can't get to. Uh, remember, we're only permitted to travel in these blue areas uh, in stealth mode. If we go into a black area, they'll see you real quick. So I'll press the fire button to launch a drone. drifted into a black area and he spotted me right away. And I can press the fire button again and see where, he, uh, where these guys is. And if there's one in range, uh, my phaser will automatically. Ah. 
They never miss. Uh, you drift into a black area, they can uh, see where you're at, and they never miss. The music is great. The science fiction -y sound effects are a lot of fun. Ah, that was a lucky shot he got my, my ship that time. So this next one, uh, Miller's graphics demo, the Pharaoh's Tomb, uh, is interesting. It's another uh, XY type maze game. And uh, in it, you've got to explore the booby trap, Pharaoh's Tomb. Uh, yes, we'll ask for instructions again. During the third dynasty of the ancient empire, there ruled a great pharaoh with enormous wealth. He commanded that all his wealth should be placed in a special tomb that was built over a very deep pit. The myths about the tomb tell us of trapdoors and walls that move. We've also heard that the king's ghost is still there protecting his treasure to this day. The arrow keys are E, S, D, and X. We'll move the daring party of yours, your five-person team, about the tomb. And when placed on a treasure, they will pick it up. You must then remember the path you took so that you can bring the treasure back out of the tomb. This is sort of like a landmines. Uh, each member of your team carries a portable drill to remove blocks in their path. To use the drill, hold down the arrow key in the direction of the block you want to drill through. Each member of your team can use their drill three times. If the wall closes up around you, you may use your drill two more times. If your drill is used up and you try to drill another block or run into the walls too often, you might bring out the king's ghost and if he catches you, he may drop a block on you. For every 10 treasures you bring out, another person will join your team and the level of difficulty will automatically increase. Two hints for a successful venture. The trap doors don't move around during the game. And if I saw a ghost, I would stand still. Yeah, so wherever these trap doors are, uh, you send one member of your party into the tomb and he falls in a trap door. Uh, don't send another person the same way. And we get that nice swirl effect. Draws a line of sprites and then sends each one out uh, at a uh, slight speed increment. Initializing, almost finished, won't be long now. Okay, so here's the maze of the Pharaoh's tomb. Here's your party of five explorers at the middle and the bottom. Uh, the one who's active is green. Uh, as you can see, there's no way to directly access this tomb. Uh, all the black areas with the red dots are blocks you have to drill through. All the blue areas are where there is treasure that you can pick up. Of course, you can't see where the trap doors are until one of your guys actually walks on it. So uh, I'm going to move my... Uh... Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I picked up that treasure. Oh, guess I can only pick up one, hold, uh, carry one treasure at a time. And I've got to go back to the uh, entrance. So I'll try going around here to the right. Oh, okay. So it walled up right behind me. So I'm going to have to drill my way out of here. So I'll press and hold the down arrow key. Okay, so my drill was able to drill through there. Went back to the uh, entrance. Okay, and they did it to me again. Walled it up. There's no on-screen thing to tell you how many times you've used your drill. Okay. This sort of reminds me. Okay. That's a trap door, and it's still there. You gotta memorize where these pesky things are. I sort of wish that once they trapped, uh, they tripped, uh, that they stayed visible, because uh, this causes a little, uh, a little more mental effort to try to remember, remember where these disappearing trap doors. <laughs> and that's how the game usually ends for me. <laughs> so we'll, uh, Here's a card game, Casino Blackjack. Just a little different rather than an arcade game. So we've always played uh, Blackjack on the TI. Yeah, I'll go for instructions. Uh, I'm a little rusty on my Blackjack rules. Uh, when we used to play uh, Blackjack at the uh, library, uh, we had a couple members that uh, uh, their minds were like uh, bear traps. Uh, they, they hit, stand, double down, do this, do that. Uh, they knew uh, instantly on how to play the odds and win at that game. So Casino Blackjack has been designed to teach you when to stand, hit, split pairs, and double down. Okay, so it's a tutorial. With help from many people, we have calculated the various odds of the dealer busting, standing, or hitting without going over 21. We've also calculated the same odds for the player. Then we applied these odds for a single 52 card deck to show you some basic rules that we will show you as you play. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has actually played uh, the TI version of Blackjack and Poker playing the black deck, Blackjack, uh, but I could swear that the computer cheats, uh, that no matter what you have, uh, if you hit, it'll bust you, and if you stand, the dealer somehow has 21, you know, or has a better hand than you do, all the way up to 21 if you have 21. Uh, not all the time, but it seems to happen more often than not. 
if anybody wants to get back to us with uh, your experiences with the Texas Instruments uh, Blackjack and Poker cartridge, please comment. The teach mode shows you the rule before you press a key. The test mode shows you the rule after you press a key, and the play only mode doesn't show you any rules. Your bet may be changed at any time before a deal. Oh, okay. The enter key enters your bet and then deals the cards afterwards. The enter key is used when you want to stand. So as usual, H is hit. That means, you know, you want to draw another card. A D key, double down, and S key, split a pair. Entering a zero for your bet will return you to the menu. Press C to consider. DC equals 8 minus A means the dealer's card equals 8, 9, 10, Jack, Queen, King, or Ace. So DC, dealer card, equals 8, 9, 10. Okay, so that's what dealer's card is. Uh, equal sign with the slash short means not equal. CP means cards played. Good luck. Press C. Select mode of play. Let's go with the teach and play uh, with one deck. Uh, you know, with uh, uh, card counting and high or low uh, averaging of what cards, uh, color cards have been played and everything, uh, Las Vegas has gotten frustrated enough. They reshuffle every hand. So you can't easily calculate your odds of getting a, uh, getting a color card or not. So we bet two dollars. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, the dealer has a jack. Uh, if he might have a uh, another uh, uh, high card and have nearly twenty, or if he has, uh, yeah, he could have twenty there. Uh, we only got six. Uh, so we'll hit to at least uh, sixteen. Uh, de dealer's card is a ten to an ace. So he's already, he might already have 21. So let's hit this anyway. So we got 13. We'll hit again. So now we got 18. Yeah, we can stand with this. Okay, so dealer one, because he had a 10 and an 11. So he had 21 to R18. Okay, so we'll try it again, $2 bet. So we can see we got a 7 and a jack. Uh, it's a 17. Uh, we're up there, but let's try a little better. Oh, I busted. Okay. Uh, that's what uh, T.I. Uh, blackjack, uh, blackjack and uh, Poker seems to do to me rather consistently. Okay, so we got a nine, uh, we got a uh, nine and a ten, a nineteen. I'll stand. Press the enter key. The dealer busted. Now, that's a rare occurrence to actually have happen. Uh, the casinos post that the uh, dealer must hit on a certain lower number and stand on a certain higher number. Uh, but if you try playing on those rules, you'll find out that they're actually favored uh, for the house, as usual. The house always wins. Okay, so we got like a 20. Now I don't know what the dealer has. And... We played. Okay, so we won. We'll press zero. Uh, play and take. We'll play play and test with one deck. We got the two dollars. Okay. Uh, push. I really don't know what push means. At two dollars, we got seven and eight. That's only fifteen. 
Ah, man should bust. Okay. So this is nice because this uh, is actually a tutorial uh, rather than a... Uh, we can play it, you know, without any hints. Or you can do the teach and play. So it's rather nice where it's a tutorial for how to, how to actually play the game. Okay, so one was Battle Over Titan, two was the Pharaoh's Tomb, three was Casino Blackjack. We did Blackbeard's Treasure already. Uh, five, Alphabet Soup, uh, is I think for the little ones in your house. And uh, learning the keys and the keyboard, where they're at. the alpha lock key okay alpha lock is up it didn't automatically detect that it. it just assumes you have it down we'll select uh for the instructions at last a cracker that won't get soggy super cracker to the rescue crunch crunch gobble gobble out of the soup the letters fly this game was designed for the younger computer user the game with speech says each letter as it is caught and then compliments the player with a few words of encouragement with the prompt mode on the computer will tell the player which letter to catch next and then displays that letter in the middle of the screen you know kids at least when i went to school uh we had a uh row above the chalkboard that has uh, had all the letters in sequence a b c d and then you sit down to a computer keyboard and it's uh, most confusing uh, how they have all these keys are all mixed up and trying to remember which uh, letter key is where. And I've read once that when the typewriter, the mechanical typewriter was first designed, uh, they were sort of delicate and easy to jam up if you typed too fast because the inertia of the moving pieces. So they purposely scrambled up the letters so you could not type too fast. And uh, that's one of the advantages of the uh, so-called uh, Dvorak keyboard over our existing QWERTY keyboard is that uh, they split the vowels, the consonants, and you can type real fast with it. So the prompt mode on the computer will tell the player which letter to catch next and displays that letter in the middle of the screen. So finally, here's something the little ones could play on the computer uh, without getting frustrated at it. The game without speech plays a little faster since there aren't any delays when the computer speaks. In order to derive the maximum benefit from this game, we recommend that the prompt mode only be used by children who aren't familiar with the alphabetical order. The object of this game is to chase and gobble the letters of the alphabet in order, A, B, C, D, etc. Use the number one joystick to move the super cracker around the screen. Try the joystick, okay? Okay. okay, so it moves like one graphic character at a time. Uh, there's no inertia. You let go of the stick and it stops moving. Press C to continue. There is a timer, timer, timer running whenever you are able to move your cracker. At the end of the game, the total time will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. Uh, let's do the game with speech, because speech is always fun on the TI. You want me to show you the next layer to chase after? Yeah, sure. Okay, so it shows the letter A. You play well now, find the B. Uh. For some reason, 
My super cracker is a letter. Ah, okay. Is, is, as usual, uh, you're working with the closed universe uh, that wraps around it. So, so whatever scrolls off of one side of the screen shows up on the other side of the screen. Okay, so that F's going to cross off the top of the screen, and it'll show up in the bottom of the screen. Okay, your screen uh, G was going off the upper uh, right side of the screen, and it's coming up here on the lower right. Okay, so I think you get the idea of how to play this game. Uh, you know, as part of uh, Texas Instruments, uh, designed to have a cartridge slot on the console and cartridges you slide in horizontally rather than vertically. So little ones or handicapped people could put them in. And it's long history of educational stuff. Uh, Craig continued that with this one on the uh, Alphabet Soup one. Okay, uh, the next one, number six, the Crazy Fun House, was inspired by a fun house at a carnival where all sorts of strange things happen. Release your alpha lock key. And yes, we want the instructions. Object to clear each maze of all dots and trip squares for high score. Each dot and trip square is worth 10 points. Trip squares, depending on the number of dots you pick up prior to stepping on a trip square, one of the following items will happen. The maze will turn invisible. Or one ghost will come out to chase you, or seven ghosts will come out and float through the maze. Invisible maze. If you step on a trip square while the maze is invisible, one of three things will then happen. The maze may become visible. One ghost may come out, or seven ghosts may come out. Hmm got me confused already with one ghost out if you step on a trip square while one ghost is out and the maze is visible then the fun house may turn red and you can chase the ghost for bonus points or the maze may become invisible the bonus points are equal to 100 times the level with one ghost out if you step on a trip square while one ghost is out and the maze is invisible, then the lights may flash on and off or the maze may become visible. With seven ghosts out, when seven ghosts are out, the maze is invisible and one of three things will happen. The lights may flash on and off or the seven ghosts may disappear or a blue square will light up in the middle of the fun house. <coughs> With seven ghosts out, while the blue square is lit up, you may stand on it and press the fire button <coughs> on the number one joystick to knock off the ghosts one at a time to collect bonus points, which are equal to 10 times the level. <coughs> Timers. There are three timers in this game which determine the amount of time the fun house will stay red, how long the ghosts will stay out, or how long the blue square will stay lit. As the level gets higher, you'll have less time to collect bonus points. Levels. As the levels increase, the timers will run shorter, the ghosts will move faster, and the bonus points will increase for every 
10,000 points, you'll receive an extra man. Welcome to the crazy fun house. If you hold down any key while our logo is coming down the screen, you'll jump over to the title screen or to the instruction prompt. If you press M and then press G at this prompt, you'll have access to the test mode. You can then pick the level you want to start on. Okay, so that's sort of nice. On the TI cartridges, I'm sure you remember it was uh, uh, what in uh, uh, Munchman. Uh, where if you do the old uh, press the shift key and then uh, numbers 838 in sequence, uh, you will get into the uh, test mode to or the level select mode where you can select what level you actually want to start the game on. Uh, several, but not uh, very many of the TI cartridges will do that, where you can do the old shift 838 trick. So just holding down any key while the logo is coming down and then press M and then G to get to the test mode. All right, these instructions <clears throat> seem very complicated and it reminds me of the uh, Robert A. Heinlein story, Starship Troopers, uh, to where they were uh, running all the cadets uh, through basic training and tests and aptitude things and things like that. And one of them, they gave them an elaborate pinball-like machine with lots and lots of instructions. And the uh, cadet, who's the main character in the book, uh, says to the uh, instructor uh, who's uh, giving them the, the, these tests that uh, these rules are contradictory and there's no way you can win this test. And uh, the instructor says, no questions, just go play it. And uh, so he says, well, he did the best he could. And uh, boy, this sure seems awful familiar. I wonder if Craig read uh, that story. Okay, so here's the crazy fun house. Uh, let's see where we're at. Uh, our character is the little letter D right in the middle of the screen. And those squares, I guess, are the so-called trip squares. So I'll try moving one square to the right. Okay, I'll go one square further north and uh, step on one of these trip squares. Okay, so the screen has changed color. I stepped on another tree. Uh, trip square. So I guess the lights went out and then came back on. He didn't explicitly say it, but I guess the idea of this is to cover the entire maze like Pac-Man. Uh-oh, now the ghosts came out. got me. I was trying to get to that one illuminated square. Okay. Okay, so now the ghost came out. Okay, so you can't see the maze, but you can see where the dots still are. So the squares that make up the maze sort of disappear. All right, let's step on another trip square again. All right. And again, you got to memorize. Oh, ghost got me again. All right. All 
All right, well, I stepped on another trip square. What was that bonus thing in that square in the middle of the screen again? What was that for? Okay, you said something about there's timers for how long uh, these uh, the ghosts stay out. Uh, we haven't gotten one ghost by itself yet. It's always been seven ghosts. Yeah, I'd like to stop this program someday and see uh, uh, see the code and the branching routines. Okay, I stood on that square and I was actually able to shoot the uh, ghosts. Uh, we still on, guys? My computer beeped. Okay, I'll assume that we're uh, still on. It might have been a messenger. Okay, so here's one ghost and it's chasing. Yeah, we're still good. Okay, so like he said in the instructions, uh, if I was being chased by a ghost, I would not stand still. Oh, crap. <laughs> I got boxed into a corner. Well, there's no more uh, there's no more trip squares left. We've stepped on all of them. Okay, we'll pick up the last two of the dots. Let's see what happens if you actually successfully uh, clear off this entire crazy fun house. Yeah, there's no way to clear it out without stepping on those trips. Oh, here's your reward for clearing out a complicated screen. Is you get another screen that's more complicated and has more trip squares in it. <laughs> Oh, gosh. We'll stop the program and list it. Okay, it starts right off uh, with programming, no credits or anything. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was all of the uh, Miller's Graphics demo disc uh, with all the different programs he did. Uh, he did a book called The Smart Programmer's Guide to Sprites, which shows you all the details uh, he used here for sprite programming. And he also did a tutorial program called Night Mission that came, up, came with a magazine-sized... Uh, uh, instruction manual, and it's a tutorial on how to program with sprites and how to do all that kind of stuff. We'll press zero here to exit. We'll find our next program. Oh, okay. Okay, we're going to load in disk number 28, so we'll 
Alpha Laka. Okay, uh, this is Astro Fighter. It's a 128 sector uh, DF80. So that loads a little different than anything else. Uh, the disk drive light's blinking like it's loading the program. So we'll see if uh, RxB can pick this up automatically or if I have to go back to it. Because my notes here say it's an EA3 program and the program name is start. There we go. So Astro Fighter. Game start. Okay, so we've got the joysticks here. And uh, my guy gets clobbered immediately. Uh, sort of reminds me of uh, Calagula. Uh, will you, uh, okay, that wasn't a bonus point. Oops. Okay, so this is like a cross between Space Invaders and uh, the other outer space games. And uh, you try to pick off the uh, guys on the outside first. Because uh, they don't change direction until you get nice explosion, nice rainbow effect there when your uh, your spacecraft blows up. So you can fire a burst of uh, round of uh, three rounds. Uh, yeah, so they uh, they don't repeat, uh, they don't change direction until they reach the end of the screen. Uh, so you always like to try to uh, shoot the uh, shoot the outer ones first. Although these guys seem to all be hugging the left side of the screen. Oops. <laughs> Why don't I just play Parsec, you know? <laughs> I usually do good on that until I get to the uh until I get to the refueling tunnel. Oh. So we did Berlin. Okay, we'll change discs again. Load program. Ah, it's a program called Biplane. Joe Morris presents Biplane. Can you destroy all the buildings to make a safe landing? Press any key to start. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Joe Morris uh, doesn't use the regular TI font. He's written his own. Uh, for this, that's a nice touch. Okay, so I guess you have to 
upon the buildings This time for sure. Whoops. Okay. So out of 19 bombs dropped, uh, only nine of them hit the buildings. Okay, so let's list this. <clears throat> okay, so this is a uh, assembly program. That's all the program there is. One line, line 10, call in it. Uh, call load 8192, 229, 226, call link run. Uh, so it's an assembly language program that's been embedded into an a, uh, extended basic program. So you can't really play around with this. Ah, okay. So here's a similar uh, routine, just one program load. This auto loads an extended basic. Uh, Entrapment has uh, been one of my favorite games for a long time since it first came out. Uh, what this is, is little insect-like creatures uh, drop down from the top of the screen, and you try to shoot them, because uh, if they uh, get to the bottom of the screen, uh, they'll destroy you. Uh, so you try to shoot them, and uh, what they will do, well, here, I'll just run it, is uh, those eggs hatch. And when you shoot them, hmm, I wonder how you shoot them. Yeah, so the insects win. So those eggs hatch at the top of the screen, and you always find yourself running uh, from one side of the screen to the, other, to the other. Now you can shoot a spread. These guys will uh, cleverly uh, sidestep your shot. Okay, now that I've stopped them long enough to actually see something here. When they hit a block, they will step left to right. And uh, they follow a, a pretty uh, defined route. So I was careless there. Those two dropped down a lot further. Now these guys will hit those blocks. And what you attempt to do is uh, trap them in these blocks. And sometimes these guys are real sneaky, depending on what side of the screen you're on. Uh, they will uh, uh, depending on what side of the screen you're on, uh, they will go the opposite direction. 
Uh, I've had it to where they'll be dropping down and you fire one bullet at them and it sees it coming and he steps out of the way. Uh, the uh, theory on this game is to build up the left and the right side uh, at the start of the game. Uh, shoot them while they're real high and make like a V-shaped funnel. So as they come down, they come right to the middle and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, destroy them easily. Uh, also, if you manage to build up uh, like a U-shaped structure, they will drop down and they will go to the left in that structure until they hit a vertical wall and to the right in the structure and they'll only repeat that a couple times and they'll die and turn into a block. Here, let's show you the difficult level. Now here's the difficult. Yeah, that's, that's level number six. That's a little tough. Yeah, that guy managed to uh, sidestep the shot. <laughs> so entrapment's a lot of fun. You can try to, uh, you notice in the upper left there, I shot a bunch of the eggs before they hatched, but then other eggs hatched. And uh, yeah, this game's a lot of fun. I've spent a lot of time on uh, this one with my friends. And uh, we've really enjoyed it a lot. Okay, selecting uh, RxB again. Just one. Okay, this is Freddy. Uh, this is distributed by TextComp and uh, has the share word notice. And uh, here's the author of it. This one's from West Germany. Gee, West Germany. How long have we had that uh, uh, that address? Uh, so Freddy Archaeologist is an explorer who is somehow at the bottom of the uh, very large rectangular maze that's much bigger than the TI screen. So you only get to see so much of the maze at a time. All of these things here on the screen, if you touch them, they get you. So... Find ammo and energy to stay alive and treasure to score. Each game level starts with Freddy on the lowest floor called Stages. Escape by the exit at the top of the maze located at Stage 1. But you don't know if it's on the left, the middle, the right, what it is. Use either joystick and fire button or keys and Y or the ESDX and Q keys to move and to fire his pistol. On ropes, fire or X. Gee, thanks, guys. Uh, the timer only uh, allowed me to do that. Only allowed me to read you so much of that screen. Come on. All right, uh, computer's getting hot here. I'm going to shut it down. Turn it back on. Sometimes when you run a whole bunch of programs or assembly programs, uh, 
one right after another. They don't clear out memory correctly, and they can give each other a hard time. Okay, so here's Freddy, and he's at the bottom of a level. Got to position Freddy's head perfectly under a rope for him to climb it. And I can move left, and I can jump off that rope, and I can climb another one. What you usually find hanging on the wall are scorpions. Now, you see, I can't go all the way up to the topmost level. You pick up treasures. I don't want to land on that rat. Oh, those are your lives at the bottom of the screen. You got like 10 or 15 of them. That's your health points. So what you have to do, if you press fire button while you're on a rope, you'll slide all the way down to the bottom. However, that really didn't get us anywhere. Okay, and those scorpions like to uh, change what side of the... Uh, that they're on frequently. But you can change what side of the rope you're hanging from. And uh, this Freddy archaeology is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, now there on the left side of the screen is sand and rock. You know, that's where this tomb is buried. And the uh, green is the uh, actual side of the uh, this underground area. We can climb up to the top of this rope and there's nowhere to go <clears throat> so we go down and go right and we can jump and you can climb up so Freddy archaeologist uh, he starts in a different spot every time you play the game uh, you really can't map out uh, this maze and uh, actually, I don't know if they use the same uh, uh, same tomb. I think there's at least four different ones uh, that they use to generate this maze. Ouch. Now, you try to stay away from the scorpions, but they... Uh, they change which sides of the shaft they're on pretty quick. Oh, and there's the exit. I found the exit. So this, uh, this underground maze is about four or five screens tall and about four or five screens wide. It's a lot bigger than the TI screen displays here. And uh, it really is the uh, test of your memory to uh, remember where you've been and how to get up and find this exit. We'll finish going up to the exit. Change discs again. Let me check my notes. This one, the disc name is Gravity. It can be one of several programs. Uh, High Gravity, Gravity Master. Oh, 
Oh, this is high gravity. Okay. Uh, this is fun. It shows you different size planets. And of course, the bigger the planet, I think the higher the gravity is. Uh, you have a, uh, your mission is to send a supply capsule on a ballistic trajectory to Space Station X. Some have failed to find a route through the complex gravitational fields of this dense planetary system. Launch direction is from the center of the ship to a flashing cursor. You have 10 capsules on board and Space Station X is counting on you. Incidentally, don't crash this capsule into your own ship. Uh, press fire on the joystick and use. Use the joystick to point in the direction to launch the capsule. Make sure alpha lock is up. The following keys allow you to change these parameters. Uh, I is the original initial velocity, which is 5. R is the density of planets is 100. S is the scale is 10. H is hyperspace is 0. W wink rate is 2. D to debug is 0. P for planets equals 9. K for a dark star is 0. Effective the next game, uh, C, the number of capsules equals 10. T, the minimum planet separation is 50. A, abandon the mission. Question mark, display the screen and clear the dots. Okay, so here's our uh, spacecraft on the left. And this little cursor that I'm moving left and right uh, is the direction it's going to f uh, try to fi fire it at. So if we put the cursor like, okay, you can wrap around here, uh, we might be able to try to fire this cursor backwards. So let's press fire. Okay, no, it went directly across the screen towards the uh, cursor. Uh, so let's go a little higher. Okay. All right, that's a real high gravity planet. Let's try shooting under it. <laughs> okay, we missed the planet that time, but it looped around. Okay, uh, let's try. I'm going to try to fire it a lot higher. Oh, wow. All so this one's a bit of a poser of uh, trying to fire the capsule ballistically uh, around the... Uh, Let's try it again. Okay, here we got. All right, we might actually be able to manage this one. Uh, if we aim the cursor, uh, aim the uh, craft, uh, the capsule halfway between these. <coughs> hmm. <laughs> I think the Space Station X is going to have a... Oh, that was close. We'll go like one square down. <coughs> Poor Space Station X, they're doing pretty bad with me as a navigator here. <coughs> no, nope, it ran out of capsules. So we could try that again. All right, the uh, I might have to uh, actually... Uh, 
uh, question mark, which is function in the I key here. Uh, let's turn the uh, density of the planets down. Enter density. Okay, we're in edit mode now. Okay, so we've uh, turned the uh, density of these planets down about 50%. Hmm. Turn the density of the planets down to like 10. They started at 100. Okay. That one went into outer space. To our next program. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Gravity Master is a fun game. <clears throat> it uh, it's a run and jump with obstacles, so sort of like uh, Major Tom and things like that. And uh, you have a, uh, I think an editor. And these are all different levels with whimsical names, like Breakaway, Castle, Coils, Crumbles, Easy Demo. Uh, all these IF-192 files are uh, levels that have been programmed for it. We'll run load here. It's loading the data off the disk. Ah, here we go. And here's your main menu to where you can build a level or you can test a level you've built. Uh, the linker, I think it links the level into the menu uh, so you can uh, actually uh, play it in sequence with everything. Disk utilities, modify screen, and finish. Um, hmm. Okay. Okay. So we have easy demo and hard demo. No. Screen name disk one. So I guess you're. Mm. Mm. Let's 
that's a game. Old catalog screens, this one. All right, so here's the screens we have. Okay, I guess that wasn't a screen name. Oh, Breakaway, I had Builder. That's an actual program. <clears throat> All right, let's try Crumbles. Okay, so some of you will probably recognize this kind of a screen. Uh, that's your character who's uh, in white. And uh, the pink things are little roving robots that try to get you. The uh, girders are things you can walk on. And the ladders you can climb. Uh, okay, so I see you can move with the ESDK. ES dx keys okay okay so i'm on a ladder so the e key works and you can jump with the j i k either straight up or to the left i'm hitting the top of the screen there Okay, okay, so this appropriately named Crumbles screen, uh, you walk across a, a dotted pattern and it crumbles. You can walk on it once. So I'm going to have to jump. Otherwise, uh, if I just walk right off this thing to the right, well, wait, I can't, can I? Well, that was five dollars. Mm -hmm. huh. I see we'd be stuck here on this girder where I got the token I had to pick up, but uh, it's uh, they have perforated the. Uh, Girder there is not letting me move. Well, I'm sorry. Try another screen. <clears throat> Somebody might have actually written a screen that you can't play. I hope this had a load program on it. That does. Okay. Hmm. The directory of this one. Oh.
Hmm. Doesn't want to load. Uh, again, I think the machine's getting warm, so I'm going to turn this off. Well, there's too many things that have been in memory and then haven't cleared it correctly. Turn it back on again. Perhaps the machine is telling us that it's time to quit. <laughs> just about. Just one more program. Just one more. Just one more. All right, here we go. A Diablo by Manuel Constantinus to Din Nidis. I'll get his name right yet. Uh, 1983. Uh, Manuel was nice enough to come to one of our fairs. And uh, we had demonstrated Diablo. We had demonstrated the uh, program that his uh, dad did that looked like it was eminently uh, adaptable to a uh, cell phone, to a small screen that's very similar to Diablo. And he brought a uh, disc of... Uh, Hmm. Well, uh, brought a disc of the uh, unfinished game that he had worked on, and he says, uh, "Yeah, I got this unfinished game, but I need to find." Uh, Somebody knows the TI assembly programming to finish it. And uh, the room laughed because half the people in there raised their hands. <laughs> for that, uh, yeah, I know how to do that. So uh, Diablo will remind you of those sliding block puzzles to where uh, you have a blank square. Hmm. Okay, you have a blank square, and uh, you fill in a uh, an actual square into the blank, and so you can shuffle around all the squares on the screen, and uh, what makes this game game fun is you have this small black moving ball, and you have to create uh, a, a track for it to. Uh, But you have to create a track for uh, the ball to roll on. Uh, you've got straight pieces of track, horizontal or vertical. Uh, you got those that curve left and right or up and down. Uh, you have a crossroads one. And uh, basically, you have to keep the ball rolling by shuffling all the squares around. OK, this is what happens when you don't follow the correct load procedure. So we're going to quit this. Now why the machine's giving me such a hard time all of a sudden. <clears throat> all right, well, it's getting fussy with us. So uh, yeah, I can take a hint, Hal. If uh, you think that uh, <laughs> it's about time that we uh, knock off for this uh, afternoon. It's been a lot of fun showing you uh, a whole bunch of different uh, games here on the TI. Uh, I wish I had been uh, more adept at the uh, first two at the uh, dice game. Um, like I said, it ran fine on my... Uh, There we go. It ran fine on my P-Box with the disc, but somehow when I copied it over uh, to the uh, final ground, it uh, it didn't work uh, that good anymore. 
Well, the the uh, answer is, I think, uh, Vic, that you need to have about six systems set up uh, <laughs> with uh, different programs or the same program on each one. And then when one wasn't wouldn't work, then you swivel about and uh, use one of the other systems because I know you've got a lot of systems. Uh, I think everybody in the community probably has two or three now. Um, and that might be that might be the answer. Okay. Now let me get our uh, end of the uh, meeting screen up here. Oh. Ah, here we go. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Hal, if you want to do a sign off for us, please. Well, uh, it's been a great, um, great show, Vic. You've done uh, some excellent work uh, showing some of the uh, uh, wonderful programs for the TI. And uh, I've had the pleasure of watching it on my 55 inch uh, TV wow. when my computer crapped out. Um, so, uh, this will be. Uh, the penultimate um, show for uh, this year. We do meet in June, but we should probably tell everybody that we normally don't have a July or an August meeting. We have a picnic, we have uh, we go sailing, uh, that type of thing um, in, uh, in those months, but we don't usually uh, have a show. Now, we can change that if we want to, of course, but I think that we have to decide on that uh, at a little bit later date. Yeah. Um, it's not a fair possibility this year at the library. What's the status with them now? Yeah, um, we are still in limbo uh, as far as the library is concerned. They haven't yet given us the definitive word. Now, the state of Illinois is just opening up. Uh, we um, just this week, I believe, we go to uh, the the bridge um, designation in the state of Illinois which means that the, um, some of the institutions that have been heretofore closed, like the library, will once again open up and uh, get permission to have um, uh, larger groups uh, meet. As it is now, um, you are limited in the amount of time you can go into the library. They don't have any um, oh. events in our large uh, meeting room and um, in fact, they offer curbside service for pickup of books. You call in and uh, uh, they will bring the books out to your car. If you do come into the library, you're required to wear a mask. You'll then find whatever books you've reserved on a shelf, which you then pick up and take to the uh, front desk. People don't go up into the upper floors anymore. <coughs> they don't let kids into the kids section. Uh, everything has been uh, shut down for quite a while now, but hopefully, hopefully this will all change in the uh, yeah. near future and we'll be able to uh, have a fair. Now, uh, what we will do is announce as soon as I know that we have uh, a reserve room, we will announce that we do and we'll announce the date. Uh, right now I put in for a specific date, which I won't announce uh, at this point until we know if we can get it. But again, we're dependent upon the uh, Northwestern University football teams uh, to have a home, or rather have an away game so that we can um, get some hotel rooms for people in the city. Otherwise, the people have to get a hotel 15 miles away when the uh, Wildcats are playing at home. Uh, they take up all the hotel rooms in the city. But at any rate, uh, we'll be in touch with everybody, letting everyone uh, know uh, on all the appropriate forums what uh, what the situation will be in the future um, uh, uh, as regards the uh, fair. Uh, so I guess uh, that's about it for me. And uh, I guess that's uh, the end of our show. Uh, Vic, back to you. Okay. Well, I've had a lot of fun uh, running through these programs. I wish the equipment worked a little better. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to learn Italian next month. And... Uh, <laughs> So I can, uh, so I can run uh, the broomstick program, or at least learn the rules to the game. I got that <laughs> late, uh, uh, late this week, and I didn't have enough time to really thrash through it. Although I did find and print out the uh, web pages from the Italian user group, 
as to the uh, various programs and where they were at and the general general idea of how it's played. Uh, anybody has any particular requests or if they know of uh, downloadable programs from somewhere else uh, that they would like to see me uh, go through. Um, I know there's a couple uh, I want to get on a uh, spreadsheet uh, program uh, that would be a uh, competitor to Microsoft Multiplans uh, on the TI. And uh, so I'll, I'll be working on other stuff. Uh, that's it from here. Okay, for all of us, uh, then from the Chicago TI user group, uh, we'll say goodbye and uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully in uh, June. Until then, bye for now. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.